our our initial um, standpoint, our initial foundation is to say that, or to recognize that modern humanity is actually extremely bad at risk assessment. And as, as the science fiction writer Peter Watts has said to me, the optimists are always wrong and the pessimists are always too optimistic. <laughs> um, uh, that's, now it's not, okay, it's still doing there. So this is a picture I took last May flying back from a, a meeting in Stockholm. Uh, this is the Greenland Ice Shield melting and huddling up. And you can decide whether your reaction is optimistic or pessimistic, but if it's pessimistic, it's not pessimistic enough, I can assure you. Okay, so what, what really is at risk? Okay, based on what, what you hear in the media versus what biologists actually think, okay? So we tend to think, or we're told oftentimes that the biosphere is about to collapse. I was just at the bookstore at the University of Nebraska yesterday. In the science and technology section, there are 20 books about how everything's falling apart. The biosphere is collapsing, everything's going extinct, humanity's collapsing, everybody's gonna die. It's all really terrible and it's all our fault and we deserve this. And our position's a little bit different, okay? so. What about the biosphere? Well, the biosphere survived for 4 billion years. Seems to be doing okay. Human beings of some sort or another have been around for at least 3 million years and they're still around. But it is Anthropocene humanity, that is modern technological, high production agriculture humanity that has gotten itself into serious trouble within less than 15,000 years. So the reality is that it's not the biosphere and it's not the human race, the human species per se, it's all this technological stuff that we've surrounded ourselves with that we think is protecting us from the imminent collapse that's affecting all the rest of the world. We've got it exactly backwards. Anthropocene humanity is fragile. And the reason for that is because We've tried to control our surroundings by oversimplifying a complex evolutionary system. In a sense, we've tried to stop the very nature of the world. Now, it's a testimony to our basic ingenuity and cleverness that we've gotten as far as we have, but our luck has now run out. And we're focused, Sal and I are focused in this book, a lot on thinking about the near horizon, that is, this date of 2050 that's showing up more and more and more uh, when climate scientists talk about what their projections are showing them. And that means if we're really thinking in terms of a 25 year window before things get really, really bad, then we need to take effective action right now. But a fundamental irony about the, the idea of taking action is that what is challenging humanity right now is what's called a no technological solution problem. As we in fact have all the technology we need to take care of ourselves and to change things. What we don't have is the proper behavior to implement what it's going to take to for us to survive. So survival, basic survival is going to require behavioral changes. But there's a problem with asking humanity to change its behavior. And that is that human beings are not wired to change behavior very easily. And there are three major reasons for that. The first is that human beings have a strong need for drama. They're much more impressed by crisis response than by prevention. All politicians know this. Most social institutions are based on the idea that crisis response is should be their job. And that prevention is something that they really don't worry about because they don't, take, don't get any credit for it. Human beings have a strong attraction to magic. 
And that's one of the reasons that the idea that technology is going to save us is very popular, especially if it's technology that we don't understand. That's even better. I have no idea what this is all about, but it's going to be wonderful. And then finally, of course, human beings have a strong aversion to bad news, especially if the bad news involves taking responsibility for what's, what's happening. So this is our background of why is it difficult to think that, that we can just say, okay, we're going to change behavior tomorrow. So we're not, we're trying to let you know that Sal and I are not naive about this. Um, we need to, to be effective. We need to not just say, okay, we're not going to oversimplify a complex evolutionary system. We have to really internalize some of the pragmatic aspects of what we know about complex systems. Now, fundamentally, complex systems are not utopian. In other words, they cannot be forced into optimal, static, unchanging states. You can try it. It will just make things worse. They do not change gradually and incrementally. There may be periods of time where they appear to be not doing much or not doing anything at all, but that's not the case. And they will lurch around and sometimes they'll be stable and then they'll move around a lot. It's not, their, their behavior is not particularly predictable. And finally, complex systems, when they are going to undergo major changes, rarely give advance warning. The complex systems, one of the hallmarks of complex systems is, oh my God, I never saw that coming. So you have to anticipate that something is going to happen before you have any evidence that it's underway. We need to cultivate a sense of detachment. Okay, and this is this is one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite authors of, of classic English mystery novels, Dorothy Sayers. Detachment is a rare future, virtue and very few people find it lovable in themselves or in others. Now, detachment is not the opposite of empathy. Okay, so a lot of people think that if you're if you take an attached view about a topic, it means you have no feeling for the topic. But that's not true. Detachment is actually the opposite of teleology. In other words, detachment is a an intellectual approach that allows you to act without having to wait to decide who's at fault, why it happened, why it didn't happen to somebody else, these sorts of things. There's a wonderful passage about this in, uh, by, by John Steinbeck in Logbook of the Sea of Cortez. So here's an example of, of professional detachment action. Okay? In medical practice, especially emergency medicine, there's a concept called triage. It was originally established for, for battlefield, handling mass casualties. And basically medical triage says, you have a whole bunch of injured people. Some of them are going to die. Some of them are going to be fine, even if you don't do anything. The ones that are going to be fine if you don't do anything, you ignore them. The ones that are going to die anyway, you ignore them and you work on the others. And you can't, if you're going to be effective at that, you can't worry about, but this one who's dying has kids and he didn't deserve to die. You can't, you, you in fact can't waste time on that because then you'll lose some of the people you could have saved. So this is what I'm talking about when I talk about having a detached view of things. And that's what we've tried to do by approaching the issue of the human situation now as if human beings were just some regular species, like they were a species of lizard or something like that. We need to demote the concept of sustainability. Okay, we don't do away with it completely, but we need to demote it. We need to put it in a, a subordinate context because sustainability studies have become the study of how humanity can continue doing what it's doing without paying a penalty for it. And in evolutionary biology, we know that in 1859, Charles Darwin showed us that that's impossible. That cannot happen. 
So what we're saying is that what we need to talk about first and foremost is survival. Now, fortunately, there is a scientific theory of survival. There's only one, but it's pretty good because Darwinian evolution is the only process that has allowed life to survive through 4 billion years of environmental perturbations, and it's never failed. This is a pretty good track record for a scientific theory. We need to give up the illusion of control. Now, this is the hallmark of the Anthropocene. This is progressive delusion on the part of humanity that we can control everything around us to achieve what we want. But evolution is about coping with change by changing, not by imposing some static state. And it's impossible for us to escape evolution. There were a lot of discussions in the late 19th century about whether or not human beings had reached the exalted state that they were outside of the laws of evolution. That, that was a delusion. And we will not survive if we don't accept these fundamental realities that the essence of survival moving forward is coping with change by changing, not by trying to figure out how to stop all change in it, dead in its tracks. So the Darwinian solution or the Darwinian evolution is fundamentally encapsulated in Darwin's phrase that diversity begets diversity. Uh, evolution, biological evolution, is an oscillating or an alternating ongoing process that involves periods of environmental stability during which time populations, species uh, are localized geographically. They specialize environmentally. They, they specialize as much as possible on, on uh, resources in their environment. And they accumulate evolutionary potential. That is, during stable periods of time, what we would technically call low fitness variants can survive and they accumulate. And so during the time that species are specializing ecologically, they are also increasing the amount of variation within the population. And it's that variation that becomes potential for survival when the conditions change, when environmental conditions change, species begin to move around, they generalize ecologically, they expand their geographic range, and they do that by using the evolutionary potential that's been stored up during the previous period of time. And this is how diversity begets diversity. It's back and forth and back and forth, and it just never stops. And all the technical aspects of this are in this book that, that um, one of the, the books that uh, that Scott mentioned, this is a book that, that Sal and I did a couple of years ago. So we have what we, we refer to as a declaration of human responsibilities. And we encapsulate that in what we call the four laws of biotics as the, the, the baseline for public policy recommendations for how humanity can survive based on implementing Darwinian principles. And the four laws of biotics are, um, I would not say that they are stolen from Isaac Asimov because we always admit that we, we took them directly from, is a direct paraphrase of Asimov's four laws of robotics. Um, these are the four laws of biotics. Uh, they're, in, they're published around and I'm not gonna read them off to you. I'm going to, what I'm going to talk to you about is immediate implications of the four laws of biotics for humanity in the next generation, next generation and a half. So the implication of what we call the zeroth law, this, this is like the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which is the law that's so fundamental that it precedes everything else. And the zeroth law of biotics is you can't blow up the planet. <laughs> you blow up the planet, then the other three laws are irrelevant, okay? Now, what Darwinian principles tell us about Anthropocene humanity and the zeroth law is that 
War has failed to resolve conflicts or promote peace. We've tried it for 9,000 years. We've been at war with ourselves constantly for 9,000 years, and it's never worked, and it never will work. And today, humanity has weapons and war machines that are capable of destroying the planet. That is a clear violation of Zeroth law. But even worse, even the so-called conventional wars, and we all know about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we all know about what's going on in Gaza, but we don't tend to remember that there are 53 other wars currently ongoing on this planet. And those are thought to be localized, regional, limited, conventional conflicts. But because our planet, our species is now so connected economically, we are so globalized economically, that the number of deaths inside those conflict zones now is less than the number of people who die outside the conflict zones as a result of the war. Okay. Any war that limits the flow of food kills hungry people outside of the war zone. So we're now at a point where um, we've, we've really messed up at a very fundamental level. And there are people who will claim, A, that human beings have always been warlike, but one of the wonderful things about the ancient DNA revolution and, and the, new, the new age paleoanthropologists is there, is there is evidence of occasional interpersonal violence and some group dis disagreements. There is no evidence of organized warfare until about 9,000 years ago. So war is not part of Darwin's struggle for survival. This is not a natural consequence of evolution. This is a decision human beings made on their own 9,000 years ago. And we know how it works. It produces never-ending conflict with no hope of resolution. And Darwinism is fundamentally a theory of conflict resolution. That's why we have a tree of life instead of one species replacing another, replacing another. Conflict resolution is what produces two divergent survivors of a single conflict. That's why the tree of life was the only illustration Darwin ever put in any edition of Origin of Species. And this, this, uh, Latin phrase here encapsulates that from the, the uh, fourth century. And it says, the translation is, therefore, he who wants peace should prepare for war. And that's what we've been doing. This just codifies something that human beings have been doing for 7,000 years by that time. War does...
Um, yeah, this is fixing technical difficulties right now for anyone not uh, reconnecting reading the chat time. text. So your USB, you have to buy it. Uh, that so I think that misses. Well, this is this is this is yeah. fun. I think no, I just, just switch to using um yeah. never mind you can't I think he, didn't he got he got locked out of the uh oh. edge roll oh is that what happened probably because I'm are you still on I'm the back on edge roll okay. um, you can try to reconnect try to reconnect and see what happens to the right so strip that so we're gonna try to reconnect um uh, Dan back to the system for some reason can you hit mute? Yep, there you go. Um, we're going to try to hook him back up here. Well, it says I'm on Edgy Roam, but it's not. Save the save it over to that, and I'll see if I can put it on this machine. Do you, so yours is is still connected in the zone. Yeah, everybody That's else. So weird. Yeah. Well, and I see. Yeah. The webcam feeds coming through, obviously. Yeah, that's on that's, that's, that's on that. Oh, uh, oh, <laughs> I see. How about in the back, Dan? USB. Yeah, you should. All right. So I should. Do I just shut my computer down? Yeah, no reason to keep it on. All right. Click on mount and open. Yeah. Just to the right. Click on that. There yeah. you go. And where is it? What's it? Yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. Click on that. And hopefully LibreOffice will present it properly. Um say yes. Say discard because you just just get rid of it. Yes. I could have a computer science person in the <laughs> yeah. in the room. It's it's not as good as it should be, but why? Yeah, well, it's... The font's wrong. Yeah, the font's wrong, but that's okay. So let's go to where we were. Yeah, there's, it's you probably was using Courier, which doesn't exist on Linux. It's mm -hmm. Windows. Oh, is that? Yeah, it is Courier. Yeah, because <laughs> with the Windows font. I didn't or, realize that. I figured it was. Did we go by this? Uh, yeah, they, okay. they license it for PowerPoint, there, which ones on Mac here, too. But you can install it on Linux anyway. But.
Well, <laughs> well, that was fun. So we're back. My apologies, folks. Not have no idea why that happened, but hopefully we're okay now. And you guys heard? Yes. Okay. Apparently they can hear you. All right. So you know. All right. No, so the, the Darwinian replacement for for warfare, of course, is don't don't have warfare. And and uh, you know, this is Sal and I are not naive. We know that just because two muddy boots biologists say let's stop <laughs> having war, that's not gonna happen. But but it is important to recognize that war is a luxury humanity can no longer afford. Okay, it's a it's not a matter of 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 whether or not we can overcome this it's a question of how how long we can keep doing this before it's it's going to make things collapse okay so the, the first law of biotics uh basically addresses the issue of the survival of the biosphere and it's basic we can't blow up the planet we can't blow up the whole biosphere either um and so this, the, the first two laws are really about basic survival. The second two laws, as, as we'll see, are about sustainability in, the, in, a, in a, a Darwinian context. So what we know is that the biosphere, the concept of the biosphere as a material commons has failed. That is conservation and sustainability policies, as well as a lot of, of, of uh, wild lands commercial development policies are all based on the assumption that the biosphere is a, is a fragile marketplace susceptible to the butterfly effect. And the Darwinian replacement for that is to recognize that the biosphere is not a marketplace. It's not a material commons. It's an evolutionary commons. That is, it's a robust evolutionary system with enormous potential for coping with change by changing. And as a result, it's not susceptible to the butterfly effect. It's highly buffered from the butterfly effect because it's a complex system. And, and if you want to understand that element or that aspect of complex systems, there's a, a wonderful uh, book, uh, another MIT book by Alicia Juarero, which has just been, was just published last year, that is the definitive statement about complex systems and what we know, what we ought to know, and, and what we sometimes don't understand. But it's a great book. If you want to really get into this, it's, it's essential reading. Darwinian conservation biology, therefore, is the opposite of making nature reserves. Darwinian conservation biology requires that nature is not fenced in that biodiversity has room to move around in response to changing conditions, that it's allowed to explore its evolutionary potential when conditions change. Mm -hmm. And that allows the biosphere's inherent strength, that is its ability to evolve or to be an evolutionary system, to be the major reason for its own survival, the guarantor of its own survival. Now, at the moment on, on this planet, there is only one functioning evolutionary commons in conservation biology. And that's the Aria de Conservación Guanacaste in Costa Rica. That is the only functioning evolutionary commons on the planet. So if we're going to, to actually follow Darwinian principles with respect to conservation biology, we got a lot of work to do. The second law, uh, has to do with how human beings interact with each other, okay? And one element of the second law is that we have to recognize that what we call the economics of growth has failed. Okay? All economic systems based on maximizing growth lead to trickle-down institutions of increasing inequality. And when I say all economic systems basic, based on maximizing growth, I mean all economic systems currently in place and that have been tried up to this point. Everything from feudalism to everything we've got on the planet today. 
And that's what allows us to, whoa, what happened? I think I did that, go back. Yes. Sorry. Uh, that's what allows us to make cartoons suggesting that even long ago, there were people who understood that our economic behavior was putting us at risk. And that oftentimes political decisions were made for economic reasons and not for reasons that were beneficial to the people that were being governed. And so the Darwinian replacement for the economics of growth, never mind the fact that Darwin showed us that unlimited growth was pathological. The Darwinian replacement for the economics of growth is what's being called the economics of well-being. This is not something new with, with me and Sal. This is, this is something that uh, a group of economists have, have been developing for a number of years. The economics of well-being says that we can grow as much as possible so long as that growth doesn't harm the well-being of others. It says that we should engage in net savings during good times and net spending during bad times. That is, you accumulate potential during the during stable times and you accumulate, are you sorry, you spend that potential during bad times. Now, almost everybody is taught that that's how family finances ought to be done. Personal finances ought to be done. But it is exactly the opposite of what governments and corporations do. I mean, one of the reasons we have problems with airplanes breaking down now is because during the pandemic, when airlines should have taken their accumulated profits and upgraded and maintained their airplanes, they spent no money because their profits were going down and they were protecting their profits rather than protecting the well-being of people like, oh, flight crew and passengers. We need to look to the informal economy as the source of, of successful economic transitions during disturbed times. Now, the informal economy is where the new ideas come from. You can't expect a factory that's, that's based on maximizing production of a single entity without innovation. You can't expect that to be the solution to new conditions. So you have to look to the informal economy for that sort of thing. And the informal economy can range all the way from, from Silicon Valley startups to people selling street food that later become really, really popular restaurants. And finally, the economics of well-being indicates that, that communities of any size ought to be engaged in circularizing their local economies as much as possible. That is, rather than, than use and throw away, use and reuse and reuse as much as possible. There are three elements of the third law of biotics that, in, that affect the way human beings interact with social institutions. And the first is that we have to recognize that large cities have failed. Again, one of the reasons we have a discipline called archaeology is because there are more abandoned cities than there are occupied cities on this planet. So we have a long, long history of cities getting really big, really powerful, and really susceptible to climate change, after which traditionally they are abandoned. And then human beings make the same mistake and start up somewhere else. And we know this because there's not a single post-apocalyptic novel or movie that shows human beings running towards big cities when there's a problem. <laughs> you know, oh my God, the aliens have landed, let's go to New York. <laughs> ah, there's a big flood, let's go, to, let's go to Boston. No, 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 we know this, we know this, but this is part of, we don't wanna believe it. We don't wanna take responsibility for this, so we just pretend it's not true even though we go to those movies and read the novels and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And as I said, this is, this is an issue that pops up in literature all the time. So this is from another mystery novel. This is an American author, Raymond Chandler, from a novel called The Long Goodbye. Um, and this shows the, the, the duality of our relationship with cities. So he says, a city no worse than others, a city rich and vigorous and full of pride, a city lost and beaten and full of emptiness. And that's that's pretty much it. And we've been pretty much doing that for 12,000 years. 
So large cities in climate insecure places are the problem, not the answer. And there are a number of reasons for that. The first is that they are density, population density traps. More than 50% of humans now live in cities, mostly in climate insecure places, which means that they have trapped themselves in high density situations where there are too many people to cope with the local food supply. Okay. This was one of the tragedies of Malthus. Malthus identified the symptoms and, and misdiagnosed the problem. Malthus thought that the reason there were so many people starving to death in London at the end of the 18th century was because poor people were having too much sex. But the reality is that it was because Great Britain had decided to relocate the early factories from the Industrial Revolution to a city that was already too big for the local food supply. That drew even more people in looking for jobs and the local food supply could not keep up with them. In addition to that, many of the people who were coming to London were coming from farms. There were young people leaving the farms. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> and so the food production even outside of London within Great Britain was, was insufficient. The response to that, the solution to that was for the, the British government to send people out to take what they needed from other countries and other people around the world that didn't have weapons that were as good as the weapons that the Brits had. Large cities and climate insecure places are hot spots for global warming. If you want to know what a three degree Celsius higher temperature world is like, go visit a major city on this planet in the middle of its summer. Washington, D.C. in August now, that's what the whole planet's going to be like. And of course, when the planet, whole planet's like that, the cities are going to be even worse. They're typically two to three degrees Celsius warmer than their surroundings. They, that's how they create their own microclimates now. If you fly into Toronto, for example, in, in the middle of a snowstorm, there is a dome of rain over Toronto and there's snow falling all around. It. Large cities are also breeding grounds for emerging infectious diseases. And we know that, and we've talked about that, and we've talked about that, and in, in people have talked about that in seminars here. These are, are the two books that, that uh, Scott mentioned earlier. Now, the Darwinian replacement for big, big overcrowded cities and climate insecure places is low density communities and climate secure places. And that involves making that transition is going to involve two different activities that actually can help each other out. One is what we call climate migration or managed retreat, or a friend of mine now refers to that, to that as the lower the lifeboats uh, approach. That means getting people out of those high density traps. And that can be helped by integrating or coordinating those kinds of activities with people who are interested in revitalizing depopulated rural areas. So the whole air study of revitalization of rural areas and getting people out of harm's way in these overcrowded cities can actually work together to help each other out if people decide to cooperate about this. In addition to that, solving basically the, the population density problem, getting human beings out into lower population density situations, out of climate insecure places, that allows human beings to be more successfully interdigitated with the wildlands rather than less interdigitated. So we're not great fans of the idea that human beings should wall themselves off in a few cities and leave the rest of the planet alone and think that that's going to solve all our problems. The second part of the third law is that institutions of social control have failed. Now, social institutions arose in the earliest cities where cooperation was essential to keep the cities functioning. But because the populations were growing in the cities, you had an increasing number of people who didn't know each other. They lacked familiarity. And as a result, they didn't know who to trust. And so the, the 
idea was that we would create institutions of social, we would institute social institutions that would help facilitate cooperation, familiarity, and trust. And those social institutions were things like religion and economics, finance systems, and governance systems. Well, this seemed like a good idea at the time, of course, but it turned out that so these social institutions had a weak spot that we didn't understand. And that was the social institutions could become mechanisms whereby one person or a small number of people could actually amplify their own personal power and control. And as a result, those social institutions became not institutions of social stability, but institutions of social control. And ultimately they became protection rackets. You pay me and I'll take care of you. You don't take care of me and bad things will happen to you. Darwin recognized this 20 years before he published Origin of Species. This is a statement from the voyage of the beagle from 1836 and this is the, the introduction to charwin uh, to darwin's passage about slavery and in this passage he says you know some people equate slavery with the condition of poor poor people in england and he said listen if the poor people in the situation with poor people in england is not the result of a natural law, but our institutions, that's our fault. And he said, besides, it's insane to equate poverty with slavery. And he goes on, and many of you may not know that Darwin's sister, for example, was one of the leading abolitionists in Great Britain. The Darwin family was very anti-slavery. And Darwin, of course, was, was a great fan of, of, of uh, Alexander von Humboldt, who was one of the first members of European nobility to speak out against slavery, in addition to being a really good field biologist. Mm -hmm. So the Darwinian replacement for institutions of social control is institutions of so social stability, okay, which require cooperation, familiarity, and trust. You can't let the sociopaths take over. <laughs> okay, The one thing that we're missing with, it, it, with social institutions today is trust. We've got a lot of familiarity, a lot of cooperation, but nobody trusts social institutions anymore, and for good reason. The way to, re, re, to rebuild trust or to restore trust is to require that our social institutions are constrained by what are called fiduciary principles. That is, they must be constrained regu in a regulatory manner to act only on the, in behalf of the people they're supposed to serve. So for example, in networks of cooperating low density circular economies, okay, those, those networks can maintain all of the benefits and avoid the problems of large densely packed cities if the institutions coordinating the cooperation among them accommodate the wishes of the people in the groups. So how do you do that? How does that, how can that rebuild trust? In the following way, a group of people come to the leaders of some social institution and say, here's what we want to do in our town. And the leaders of the social institution say, well, you know, I have an MBA from Harvard and that's not gonna work. So this is what we're gonna do to you anyway, and it'll be for your own good and you'll, you'll like it. That's, that's why there's no trust. What we have to have is a situation where the people come to the institution and say, we want to do this. And the people in the institution say, I'm not, my, all of my training says that's not going to work, but you're the people. So let's try it. There are only two possible outcomes. One is that it actually works. And the person with the MBA from Harvard learns something. And you know, the, the saying that you can, you can always tell a Harvard man, but not very much. <laughs> well, this is a way to overcome that, that, that problem of poor training that comes out of the Ivy Leagues. And the alternative to that is that you try it and it doesn't work. Then the people in the institution can come to the grassroots and say, well, we tried it. It didn't, it didn't work. How about if we tried this now? And at that point, the people are more willing to trust you to try something. 
So this is the way to rebuild trust. Now, finally, we have the issue of, of what we call survivable regrowth. In other words, we don't have to stay small. We can get big, but we can but we have to get bigger in a smarter way. And a, a, a getting bigger in a Darwinian way involves moving people away when the carrying capacity of a local area is, is exceeded. So if you're in one of those communities in a cooperating network and you're so successful that your population gets so big that it's beyond the local carrying capacity, you then encourage people to go and build a new community. So you increase the number of, of nodes in your network. You increase the number of communities. You resist what we call the Babel impulse. So we think that the story of Babel, the Tower of Babel in the Bible is actually, when you strip away the religious overtones, the original impetus for that story is it's a warning about cities that get too big and too crowded and too proud of themselves, that they will ultimately collapse. And the way to avoid that is to not get too big and too overcrowded. But if you maintain cooperating networks, you can still maintain all of the, 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 the positive aspects of size. And finally, we have to recognize that uncontrolled population is a glitch and not a feature of evolution. And by that, I mean that Darwin recognized that, that reproduction was unconstrained and that with, without any constraints on growth, growth, uncontrolled growth would lead to pathological situations, lead to a situation in which there were more organisms available than there were resources to support them. And the emergent property of that phenomenon is called natural selection. But Darwin also recognized that natural selection was a blunt instrument. In other words, if we, if our solution to the issue of human population is to simply wait until there's so many human beings that natural selection kicks in and, and lowers the population, we will have no control over who dies. We cannot depend on natural selection to lower the human population in a way that guarantees that the survivors are actually helpful and positive impacts on the future of, of humanity. So what we need is actually to read Darwin's next book, which was called The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. This is his sexual selection or subtext female choice book, which was published in 1871. And that is to recognize that the all of the countries on this planet that have sustainable fertility rates have one thing in common, and that is all of those countries have educational and economic opportunities for their women. Every time that happens, women in in consultation with their men, regulate their reproductive output downward. Obviously, this is much easier to say than to do. <laughs> but we believe that humanity is heading for a fall. But between the Scylla of unattainable utopia and the Charybdis of unacceptable apocalypse, Darwinian principles actually offer some hope for survival. And there are two aspects of this. There are two ways, what we call the third way, there are two options for survival. One of them we call the bottleneck and rebound. This is the 2050 is going to be bad, but we'll get through it. That means that we need to alter our behavior now at enormous expense and inconvenience. And what will then happen is that we will metaphorically fall to our knees and then stand up. And, and to use a business model, this would be equivalent to modern humanity downsizing and restructuring. The alternative is what we call the collapse and rebuild mode, which is <clears throat> we just keep doing what we're doing, hoping that it won't get worse. And in that case, that's what we call continuing business as usual. In that case, we're likely to fall on our faces metaphorically. And in a, in a business model, this would be the equivalent of a corporation going bankrupt and disappearing and failing. But 
there's always, even if the if there's bankruptcy and failure, there's still the possibility of building a new corporation. So this is that even that worst case scenario, if you adopt Darwinian principles, can lead to a rebuild of of humanity. So this is not a time for desperate heroics or despair. All those books about how everything's going to hell are just that's that we we should just not even bother with them because that's not what's going to happen. We need to be pragmatic, proactive, and persistent. We need to cope with the present and spend potential on the future. We need to, to cope with change by changing based on capacities that we already have. We need fundamentally to build trust. And to paraphrase the Grateful Dead, we will get by. We need going forward all policy proposals associated with climate change and, and human activities need to be judged by the four laws. Say, does this proposal contravene any of the four laws? If not, then the proposal can continue. Does it enhance survival and well being? If it does, then it should be funded. Can it be improved without violating the four laws? If it can, then improve it. And just following those three guidelines still leaves an enormous amount of, of space for human creativity to produce a lot of different effective action plans because there's not going to be one, one plan that fits the whole world. There are going to be lots and lots of effective ways to survive. And again, to paraphrase the Grateful Dead, we will survive because we have to remember that the human condition does not have to be perfect by 2050. It only has to be survivable by 2050. So we don't have to finish the job by 2050. We just have to be able to survive at 2050 and move forward from that. So sorry about the technological glitch, but that sort of underscores our book. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. All right, let's see if we can get questions. Any questions uh, from the in-house people first? Go ahead, Ethan. Yeah, can you, uh, can you re repeat the name of that book um, and the author you recommended about complex systems? Oh, yeah, that's Alicia Juarero's book. Okay. Um, um, uh, oh. Oh, and Alicia, Alicia's online. Alicia, <laughs> I just blanked. Unmute yourself and, and tell Nathan the, the, the title of your book. Oh, did she go off? Maybe she's. No. Can they hear us? Did she go away? Are they not hearing? They should be. Oh. But I can't. It's yeah, sorry, she is. Yeah. Thank Alicia, you. Thanks I'm sorry I blanked. Tell us the, no, the name no, no. of the book. Thanks for the plug. It's called Context Changes Everything. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it should. A MIT Press, 2023. Yeah, thank you. We've got it. Oh, okay. You've got oh, no, she I, muted again. Yeah, I, I was just checking. We mi okay. Yeah. Oh, we missed the... We missed it. Sorry. Can... Oh, context changes everything. That's right. Context awesome. changes everything. Right. And it's so, MIT Press 2023. MIT Essential Press. reading. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you that. so much. Thank you. I just I just blanked. I'm sorry. Thank you. No. <laughs> El viejo. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hello, I'm great. Okay, what others? <laughs> Anybody else out there in uh, internet land? Actually, I do have a question. Go ahead. Um, then I hadn't, I don't remember having heard you talk before about the fiduciary principles. And I really like that idea, and especially that you bring in the notion of regulation, and you mentioned it there, and then you mentioned it also with uh, the women, and it's and it's I find that very interesting because that's almost a meta layer. So you've got structure, you've got function, and then in a sense you've got regulation, and the regulation regulates the function. So it's a it's a it's it's on top of the function, and I was thinking of things like the, I mean when I visited Singapore, it really 
uh, made me question my beliefs in democracy because it works <laughs> so well and it's and and it's so rigid and authoritarian. But I was fascinated by their algorithm where you, no matter how much money you have, you cannot get a, a car registered unless the algorithm says the carrying capacity of the city is enough and they will and they will price it accordingly. So it doesn't matter if you're a billionaire, you will not be able to buy a license unless the, the carrying capacity is there. And so I find that that whole thing, the whole notion of regulatory processes very, very interesting. And so I think that's a very good aspect to focus on. Well, well, thank you for that. And this is this is exactly why I say your book is essential reading. Oh, no, I no, I don't. You know, I I, I I don't bring that in. I just think that there are different kinds of constraints. They're enabling constraints. And that is you give yeah, tax yeah. breaks, you give tax breaks to people to go out into rural communities that are in, in non climate uh, threatened areas. So that's an enabling constraint that would encourage people. But then you also need to have stabilizing constraints and and regulatory constraints. And those are different because those are more policy uh, or, or, or I don't know what the word is, re re regulations. I live in DC. So boy, we talk about regulatory agencies all the time in DC. So it, it you know, and so you look at those and they all fit into your your ideas here. So I like that. Well, thank you. Cool. Anything else? Ricardo, anything from Poland? You're muted. You're muted. You're muted, Ricardo. You have to hit your unmute. You're muted on your microphone, Ricardo. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. No. Okay. No, it's all very interesting to me because it's many of these ideas I teach to my students too. I can't. Well, you know, biologists. Every time we have uh, uh, Darwin and um, evolution in our minds, ever think about it. It is very clear to me the increase of the population is a big problem. But this is also a problem with politics, policy. I did my doctoral degree in Poland in socialist times, in the end of 70s. In that time, to move from one city to another city was close to impossible. Why? Because they don't like that the cities grow so much. So, Warsaw is a very open green city, a little more than two millions of people living here. It's no high density of people, but outside of Poland, the people claim, what about the freedom of the people? The people like to move everywhere. Like they have the right to live that they want. So how we can do to disseminate it the cities, that the people go back to the field, and the, that the cities don't grow so much, because it is really a problem. How we can do it well, in the true, yeah, in one the reality? Of, yeah, one of the interesting things is that in the United States, the projections going forward to 2050 uh, are that, and there was just a recent article in uh, Wired magazine about this just in the last couple of days, that projections are that more than 50% of American cities are going to lose population over the, over the next decade. So in fact, the, the uh, climate migration and economic migration away from large cities in climate insecure areas is already underway in the United States. Uh, and, and so we're not we're not suggesting something. We're acknowledging that something that's beginning to happen should be recognized as a as a positive development. And at the same time, because there are many uh, uh, depopulated rural towns across the United States, there is an opportunity for the climate migrants to have a soft landing, to have a suitable place to go to live, rather than simply. Uh, becoming vagabonds. So it's not like a new uh, Dust Bowl era 
uh, the Okies uh, on the road. This, this actually uh, could provide, if you have the rural revitalization people and the, the climate migration people working together, you could actually uh, make this happen. And, and that could be exported to any country. You could make this happen in a, a, a pretty peaceful way. The transition could be could be pretty good if yeah, if we the, we want to do it, and that, that's why it comes back to uh, <laughs> you know the issue of whether or not human beings will change their behavior. Yeah, but but what's going on with the uh, the countries, undeveloped countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America? Day after day, the people migrate to the capital, to the big cities. Yes, no, yeah, that's, that is that is a, a really good point. And it's a really unfortunate thing because the countries, there are a lot of countries that, in a sense, they have followed the mistakes of countries that, that, that created large crowded cities before. And the one, the one positive thing about that is the countries that at the moment have a trend towards people moving into cities because they, they have not committed to big cities to the extent that places like the United States have. It ought to be easier for them to simply slow down and stop that process. So they don't, there, there's no reason that they have to, you know, go into these super overcrowded cities, have those cities collapse and then revitalize their rural areas. They can tap the brakes on the car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. I mean, if they want to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Ricardo. Okay. Which has yeah, been great, great, great comment. Yeah. Best wishes. Anything else? All right. Well, I think uh, no other questions or comments from the internet, and uh, I think we're good in here. So. Thanks so much, Dan, for being here. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And we will see everyone here very soon. As soon as we get the schedule filled out, we'll all let everyone know via email and also on Facebook. So thanks for being here. Thanks, Bye -bye. Uh, thanks Scott. And thanks, Dan. That okay, was very powerful. Ah, I know, <laughs> I know that face. You're right there, Eric. You're in front of us all.